Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, Charles, can you lead us in prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, can I pray? Go ahead, Kennedy. Our Heavenly Father, Jehovah, thank you for this great day that you've given us uh, as a family, Father Jehovah. We come before you, Father Jehovah, believing and trusting in you, Father. You are the only God who is worthy to be worshipped, Father Jehovah. Father, I commit your servant, Pastor Emmanuel, Father, into your hands, Father. I pray for blessing over his life, Father Jehovah. And he's leading us and teaching us, Father Jehovah. Let it not just be held in the Father Jehovah. I pray that it will be something practical in our lives, Father. It will change us, Father, you know, for your honor and glory, Father Jehovah, wherever we are, Father Jehovah. I pray and trust that Jehovah, when our colleagues, Father, are joining, Father Jehovah, that you will have them and Father, you give us good network, Father, today, Father Jehovah, to learn in our word, Father Jehovah. Thank you, Father, for everything and all the goodness of Father Jehovah. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kennedy, for leading us in prayer. Uh, okay. Uh, before we go ahead, uh, so let's just look at what we did. Yes, Charles. Uh, uh, I think your network is a bit low. Uh, your voice is breaking. Uh, yes, we'll begin with the class, Charles. Uh, I requested you to pray. Uh, it's all right. Uh, Kennedy has prayed. Uh, so let's uh, pick up from where we stopped um, yesterday. Yesterday, we came to a close of uh, chapter 7. We looked at the glory of God. We looked at how you know, the glory of God brings so many things into our midst. The power of God, the presence, the goodness of God. Um, and we looked at the example of how of Moses, where he had the encounter with God himself. And then last class, we looked at understanding the manifestations of uh, the presence of God. So uh, what we've studied in the, the Holy Spirit class, uh, the Holy Spirit is like fire. His presence is like rain, like light. Uh, uh, and and uh, his presence brings goodness, mercies. And his presence is like a voice. His presence uh, 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 causes signs and wonders. And so even as we are praying for revival and we are praying for an outpouring, a move of God among us, we learn that it's very important not to judge people uh, or not to condemn or critique people for the way that they are you know, manifesting the presence of God in their life because we learn that God is able to touch not only our spirit but also our soul and our body. And so we must be open to what the Holy Spirit is doing. And even as we are open, we must remember that we should not uh, manufacture our own kinds of uh, you know, uh, ideologies and even, you know, sometimes God may minister to us in a different way compared to the others. So uh, so we should not, uh, you know, uh, judge people saying, okay, maybe this is how it is or this is how the Holy Spirit is. No, uh, God can work in his own way. So these are just practical things, practical points that as a church, uh, you know, we must uh, be aware of this. Now, the reason we are talking about this is because it should not be that, you know, we're praying for revival. God is manifesting himself in different ways. And just because of our differences, uh, there should not be a, a hindrance to the move of God. Right. So we wrapped up on chapter seven. Let's pick up chapter eight. Now, a few of this may be a few points may be repeated. But uh, uh, we want to learn this this in this chapter about uh, the pursuit of revival. Right? So we, we are we are praying for revival, but we also have to pursue for revival. Pursue is to uh, strain on to to take it to to you know continue till you see it come to pass, right? Uh, so we learned last class and last chapter that revival is a move of God, and we cannot manufacture it. Uh, but what we can do is prepare for it and pray for revival. Uh, and so in this chapter, we want to just provide some tips and some uh, ways to help us, you know, press in for revival, to help us press in for the move of God. Right? So let's look at a few points here. First one, pursuing 
after God, pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ, pursuing his presence. Right? Jeremiah 29, 13, here's what it says. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Right? So Jeremiah, God is talking to the prophet Jeremiah and he's telling the Israelites. Now, remember that uh, uh, Jerusalem is on the brink of another siege from the Babylonians, right? Uh, they are on the brink of disaster, right? And God is reminding the people uh, that through the prophet Jeremiah that if you seek me and, and you search for me with all your heart, you will find me. Right, so it's so true. Even as we have seen throughout history, you know, people were have engaged in prayer, have earnestly seeked God. Right, earnestly they have prayed and searched for God during their times of difficulties, and uh, and and we saw that God answered them. The glory of God fell upon them. God ministered to them. So. Remember that even as we pursue God, uh, it's not that God is holding himself back. He's not, uh, you know, hiding and he's saying, okay, um, you know, uh, let him ask for some more and then I will decide. No, God is a God who always responds to hunger, right? Uh, he, he's not that he's making himself inaccessible. It's not that way. But he looks for those who are searching for him who are earnestly seeking him. And when we do that, he's a God who answers and he's a God who will reveal his presence, his glory in our midst. So very important, pursue him in prayer, pursue him in worship, pursue the works of the Holy Spirit, pursue the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right Now, as we are all in ministry, one of the very, very important points uh, in life, and especially in ministry, we must remember that uh, I always keep telling this verse to myself, Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. So our ministry, our life should be birthed out of this pursuit that we have for God, a pursuit of his presence, right? So it, it should be that in a way that every day we wake up, we say, God, speak to me today in your own special way. Maybe yesterday God speak to us, spoke to us in this way. This way, God, speak to us in a different way. Maybe through the word or through worship or even as I go about doing my studies or uh, as I'm preparing, uh, maybe I'm at home just doing the household chores. Speak to me, Lord. If we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Right? So we are to pursue God, pursue him to, you know, the word pursue is to uh, run and catch, right? To run after, right? Uh, uh, you can get a picture of, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe, uh, maybe a wrong uh, example, but it makes sense. You see, if, if, a, if a thief or a robber is running away, uh, you know, uh, from the police, and the police are after him, right? Uh, what are they doing? They are after him. You know, you may have seen these uh, high-speed pursuits that happen where they probably they have robbed something, taken the car, and then they've dashed onto the highway, and they're in hot pursuit, meaning the, the police are just after him. There's nothing else on their mind, they're not thinking about what's there for lunch, what's there for dinner, or uh, they're not thinking about their family, nothing. Their mind is focused to get this person. It's a pursuit after him. Maybe, sorry, maybe a wrong an analogy, but just trying to bring that picture that we are to be in pursuit after God, right? day after day. One of the best examples is First Kings chapter 18. Now, Elijah, God has called Elijah and, uh, uh, yes, Charles, do you want to say something? Uh, okay. Uh, so 
the best example, a good example is Elijah, where God is speaking, called Elijah. There is King Ahab and Jezebel who have completely destroyed uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, they have brought in idol worship, immorality. And now Elijah is there. And he it hasn't rained for about three years now. God has stopped the rain right, on the people. Now, we know that if there's no rain, there's no fruit. If there's no fruit, there's no income. There's no, uh, there's no rain, there's no labor, there's no fruit, there's no income. And now the nation of Israel is going through a major calamity. Right? God stopped the rain for three years. And now Elijah is there. And it's so wonderful, uh, you know. He uh, before that he say he, you know, God puts him in the mountain, and there he's been fed by the ravens. What does he do there? He's pursuing after God. He's praying and he's saying, God, let this nation be restored. Restore your people. Let this not be the end. Let this not be something that has, you know, that King Ahab and Jezebel are building uh, on your land. You're a covenant keeping God. He's praying in that mountain. And then at the right time, God brought him out. And, and then he meets with Ahab. We know the story. They go up to the Mount, uh, Mount Carmel. And Elijah alone versus the 800 prophets of Baal and Asherod. And the God that answers by fire is a true and the living God. And God answered him. Then he goes back to the mountain. And he knew that if we pursue God, now that their hearts are changed, if we pursue God, God will answer our prayers and he will open up the heavens and bring rain. So what did he do? He went back to the mountain and he began to pray. Now, Elijah knew that God is going to do it. Right? He knew that God is going to open up the heavens because people have turned away from their sin. They've repented. But here's something interesting Elijah did. He went back, he knelt down and he prayed. Elijah didn't say, okay, I won one, 800 against one, me alone, and I won. And so that was a wonderful victory. So let's go home, let's rest, take a break, relax. No, he went back and he said, now we got to pray for rain. Pray that God blesses his people. And so he begins to pray. We know the story. It's about... Six times he sends his servant, go and check if the rain has come. Right? And then the seventh time they saw the hand, you know, a cloud in the size of a fist. So what are we getting at? Even in our greatest victories, pursue God. Even in our greatest failures, pursue God. That pursuit for God should never stop. We may have seen the wonderful miracles in our life we may have not seen it yet and we are praying for it continue to pursue god that's what elijah did he saw the great victories right but he knew that there requires there there needs to be prayer picture this what if elijah went back he said okay i've done my part right now let somebody else play, pray for rain i've done my part Right. Uh, uh, maybe there wouldn't have been rain still because God is seeking those who pursue after him. He answers those who are hungry for him. Right. So our pursuit for God should be a constant thing in our life. Right. Even in our old age, or young age, no matter what our age is, our pursuit should be constantly for God. Second one, Stir up yourself and lay a hold of God. Right? Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Stir up, fan into flame, a passion for his, for your, for his name. So basically he's telling Timothy, Timothy, even as you do ministry, even as you go ahead and look at the th uh, you know, different aspects of the church in Ephesus, you're pastoring this church, there are many people, the church is growing. As you keep doing ministry, there may be a time when you may get drained out. You may get tired. 
Here's the thing. Timothy, fan into flame a passion for his name. Right? Stir up. Spirit, ask the Spirit of God to stir up and fan into flame the passion for his name. Let's read this. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 1 to 7. It's in your notes, page 93. Isaiah 62, 1 to 7. Yes, can one of us please read that? Isaiah 62, verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 62, 1 to 7. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Until her righteousness goes forth as, bright, as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You should be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. It will also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who made mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. And give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christopher. So let's paint a picture now. Here, the prophet Isaiah is talking to the Israelites and he's, he's telling them, now, be passionate about God, even though you are in captivity, right? uh, uh, it looks like nothing is going right your way. Don't lose that passion for God. Don't lose the 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 whole. Uh, you know, don't lose that knowing of who God is, right? And so he's encouraging uh, the the Israelites, and he's telling them, uh, you know, so many verses. He says, uh, you know, uh, you sh you shall no longer be termed forsaken. You shall your land should not be desolate. You should be called Hepzibah. Your land Beulah. The Lord delights in you. Your land should be married. Uh, 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 you know, you will rejoice like the uh, uh, like as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride. Uh, and so he's telling them, do not be at rest. Continue to stir up your heart. Right now, we know that in Isaiah chapter sixty, he says, you know, he's uh, he's telling them, hey, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though darkness has covered the earth, dark thick darkness, the sky, the Lord has risen upon you. And so, Isaiah, he's bringing that, you know, that whole feeling of passion for God into the hearts of people. He knew that. Just uh, probably a year later, the Assyrians, uh, sorry, the Babylonians are going to come and attack Israel and they're going to be taken into captivity. He knew it. But what is he saying? He's saying, nevertheless, nevertheless, we will see Zion restored. We will see our nation being restored. So what is Isaiah doing? It's so powerful. He's... He knows what's going to happen next. He knows that, you know, there's going to be a, a siege. The Babylonians are going to come. They're going to overpower, overthrow the nation of Israel. They, he, he knows it. But he's looking beyond that. And he's saying, hey, even if they come and they overpower, they, we are in captivity. This is the promise of the Lord. 
right that he will you know he will never leave us we will rejoice he will uh, he will bring uh, you know joy in our midst he will establish us in all of this so what is what is isaiah doing he is reminding the people that it is even through the difficulties even through what is ahead the challenges that are ahead even though there is going to be difficulties ahead take hold of god stir up your heart remember who god is remember what he has done for the nation of israel remember that we were in captivity remember the way he has blessed us remember that the things that we are going through is not because of god but it's because of we have sinned against god and that is why we are going through this but yet through our sin god is compassionate he's gracious he will hear our prayers so it's so powerful right uh, isaiah is encouraging his the 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 believe the jews the israelites don't go dry in your heart don't go dry in your spirit stir up your heart so that god can you know uh, reveal his glory into our midst right now picture this imagine the you know how isaiah would be feeling maybe when god spoke to him he would have said god but you know it's in a couple in a year or so the 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 babylonians are going to come they're going to destroy us they're going to take us into captivity uh, how can i declare this prophecy right? but isaiah doesn't do that he says no the bigger picture is god has called us and so we are to stir up our hearts for the things of god take a hold of him right i like that verse take hold of who god is right maybe some of us in our lives we we are, we are going through different challenges take hold of who god is in your life right uh i'll give you this as an example in genesis 32 uh it's a, it's a wonderful story you should read the story of jacob it's such a powerful story born with the name jacob a deceiver right and he was true to his name at a young age he deceived his own father he deceived esau his father asked him what is your name he says my name is esau and he takes the blessings uh from his father and then many years later jacob is running away from esau right now god has still blessed esau but jacob is running away and now his earthly father asks him the same question what his sorry his heavenly father asks him the same question which is what is your name and this time he says my name is jacob genesis 32 he, you know he's he wrestles with god what does he say he said god i am not going to let you go until you bless me was jacob blessed already yes he was he was just fearful that you know esau is going to come and kill him that's all he was fearful of right? but he was already blessed god blessed him right he had you know later on we see that he had thousands of servants and uh, you know hundreds of uh, camels and ox and land and he was blessed what is he saying there there is a story to he saying god i will not let you go until you bless me he took hold of who god is yes god i made a mistake i said something wrong i i i i uh, yes i was true to my name being a deceiver but now god is saying you are no longer a deceiver your name shall be called israel and out of that out of you shall come shall carry forward the descendants of abraham that is such a powerful thing jacob did not go and you know they say okay i'm done you know uh, esau is anyway coming after me is going to kill me and uh, you know he didn't do anything he didn't say that he took hold of who god is he said god i know who you are i want you to bless me bless me that i may be used and so we as believers can take hold of who god is take hold of who he is hold on to him and uh you know uh, yesterday we were having our family prayers and uh we were really tired and said okay anyways we have to 
you know, we have this habit, we have to pray before we sleep. And so got the kids around, began to pray. And we just thought, okay, you know, half an hour, we'll just sing a few songs, read the word. And we usually wrap up in an hour. And so yesterday, we, you know, we just began to pray, uh, singing songs and, re and we read the word. And the moment we began to pray, uh, there was this, you know, I was preparing for this also. And I, there was a sense of, you know, take hold of God in our heart, in my heart especially. I said, okay, God, I'm going to take hold of you. Well, uh, I don't want to let you go right? because there's so much that's happening around in this world and we would be so lost without you. And so this whole sense of, you know, dependence on God, wanting to know him, wanting to pursue him. And, you know, we realized that we just kept praying and praying and praying. And, you know, we spent a couple of hours just being there in God's presence, just drawing from him and it's a wonderful time we went way past midnight but it was a time where we felt so refreshed in our spirit because we pursue after him so i want to encourage each one of us pursue go after stir up in your heart right sometimes we may get bored reading the bible or we may get bored uh, listening to the same old gospel songs stir up your heart don't give up. Right? When you read the word, say, God, stir my heart that the Holy Spirit will minister to me even as I read this word. Right? Don't let, you know, especially when things get monotonous, you get that feeling. You know, shake it off. Say, God, stir me. Stir my spirit. Fan into flame a passion for your name. <clears throat> Third one. The heart condition for revival praying. Right, first one we saw is pursuing him. Second one is to stir up yourself, take hold of God. Third one, the heart condition for revival praying. We know that uh, reformation is, is aligning to truth, removing what is wrong. That's what Martin Luther did in his 95 thesis. Revival begins with personal transformation. Right. Remember this. Revival begins with me first. So if we look at all the revivals that happened, it was because the person who prayed for revival, it started with that person in their heart, in their minds. They felt, hey, God, there's so much that I have to do. There's so much, so many things that I have to change. So revival starts off within us. And then when it starts within us, it begins to spread to the others, right? Uh, revival begins with us, right? Sometimes we may think, okay, maybe because of this, maybe because of that, we are not seeing a move of God, or maybe that is not right, this is not right. Maybe we are not praying the right prayer points, or you know, maybe we haven't uh, spent enough time. Yes, all that is a part of it, but remember, revival begins with us. An outpouring of God begins from us, right? So, for example, you're in the church, you're maybe a ministry leader, you're maybe even a pastor or an evangelist, whatever God has called you to be. That feeling of revival, that outpouring, a move of God begins when we ourselves are first desperate and our heart condition is right before God. Remember uh, in the Old Testament, David, right? David, uh, if you read through the whole uh, um, of, you know, the, uh, the whole story of how Saul became king and how he, you know, God called him, Saul's story also is kind of one. It is, you know, God tells Saul, uh, Samuel, go and anoint Saul. And there's a verse there which says that, in, in Saul's heart, he himself thought he was a no good, right? And Samuel reminds him of that. Things were going good in the nation of Israel. He was, he was a good king. Initially, he won many battles. But somewhere in between, his heart was not right. 
that's when you know god told him uh, god told samuel tell saul even as he after he kills the moabites so uh, not to bring anything no animals nothing kill everything and come back but saul disobeyed he 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 brought animals and he said oh this is for the slaughter to offer to our god and then uh, samuel comes the prophet and he says obedience is better than sacrifice and you know at that moment his saul's heart itself was not you know it was not in line with god's heart a heart condition is very important why 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 did why did god love david so much you know he committed if, if you look at proverbs and you look at even before that sexual immorality was something very serious god despised it he said oh, you know sexual immoral morality i will despise it i hate it i reject it even through exodus exodus and numbers when the israelites came out they were uh, uh, you know the whole event where uh, they had put their tents and they were camping in a place and uh you know the israelites were taking more about and canaanite women and uh, engaging with them and god was really you know ready to pour down his vengeance upon them because it is something that he does not uh accept he cannot accept sexual immorality but here david has committed that heinous crime right but why didn't he do anything to david it's not that god was showing favoritism but david prayed this way he says god search my heart i always i always tell people and i, I, I the first time i read that I, i thought to myself this is a dangerous prayer imagine we are praying god search my heart now if we give god the the option to search our heart and he's going to dig deep into our heart and he will know what we think about others he will know what what's happening in our deepest you know in the deepest secrets of our heart sometimes we don't want anyone to know right uh, it's it's good we'll just keep it to ourselves but here david says god search my heart he was a man even though he sinned he was his heart was right before god right his heart was god i have sinned i deserve whatever punishment you give me and he went and he prayed and he wept and then we see that he lost his son he again wept but he stood back and he said okay god even through these challenges even through these difficulties even through my failures i want my heart to be aligned with you so god loved that it's a very important lesson that we can learn as we do ministry let our heart be true to god right it may be a small ministry it may be a big ministry it's the heart that matters right he searches our heart he knows our heart remember the lord jesus even when he ministering in the book of john he's ministering to his um uh, disciples and the thousands of people who are coming what did jesus say in the book of john is very clear he says he knew their heart he knew what they were thinking he knew every thought that they were thinking in their heart he knew that they didn't believe he is the messiah that was not something new for him jesus knew it yet he was compassionate so our heart needs to be right before god revival starts from inside remember peter jesus died he resurrected he's gone and peter says oh i i i don't think i want to do this i just go back to my other job go back to fishing and all of a sudden after the lord jesus met with him the resurrected jesus and uh you know jesus gives him the commission you lead the church take care of my sheep there was a revival inside his own heart right his heart condition changed all this while he was you know in guilt oh you know i was i betrayed him i denied him by that moment when god 
the Lord Jesus gave him that commission, his heart was changed. His heart was restored back to his first love for the Lord Jesus. And we see that later on, he stood there in front of the, uh, the people in Jerusalem, in front of the temple, and he preached his first sermon, leading 3,000 people added into the church. It was his heart. There was revival inside. His heart condition changed. Everything changed. And so, when we are pursuing him, when we are pursuing for intimacy with God, we are to check our heart, check our motives. Is our motives right? right? Now, here are a few of the heart conditions that we must maintain. Now, we know that our heart condition is very important. So how should our heart be when we are praying for revival? First and very, very, very important is a heart that is humble. The Lord, the word, the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to those who are humble. He opposes the proud. The moment we are proud, the word is, there is opposes. He doesn't reject the proud, right? but he opposes that. Right? He's not for it. A humble heart is willing to accept the responsibility for wrongdoing, for failures. Right? It's a humble heart is willing to, you know, surrender and yield to God's will. Right? Now, for example, God may tell us, okay, I want you to go and minister to this people, these people, or I want you to go to this city or that city, another city, and uh, do a work there. If we are not humble in our hearts, we may not accept that. We may say, God, no, I want to be here. This is where I was born. This is where I was brought up. So I will do the ministry here itself. Now, God won't reject you and say, okay, you will never be a pastor or you'll never be an evangelist. No. But since our heart was not humbled before God, we have not obeyed what God wanted us to do. He has not rejected us. Yet, because of our pride, there will be a hindrance to a move of God in our midst. And a humble heart is a heart that surrenders to his will. Right? So, a humility. Now, many people uh, look at humility and say, you know, to be meek. And the Lord Jesus was, was humble, but he was also, he also walked in authority. Right? So it doesn't mean being humble is just to, you know, agree to everything what people say. No, you be humble in our heart. I mean, our heart is humble before God. But we also do what God has called us to do in authority, in dominion, in power, in strength. Humility is the most powerful tool that we can use, right? A humble heart is always dependent on God and not on our personal efforts right so even as we're praying for revival we're not saying oh i prayed six hours a day that's why revival that, that's why i see an outpouring of god no saying god it is because of you it is because of your presence it is because of your spirit and it's not about us right uh God has given us gifts and talents. Some of us can preach, some can lead worship, some are good teachers of the word of God, some are scholars, good apologetics, some write songs, come up with melody to the songs. And God has given all of us different tools. But we are to be humble before God and say, God, it's not about me. It's not about what I have achieved, but it's about you in my life. The moment we humble ourselves, right? Uh, especially when we look around nowadays, it's a sad thing when we see Christendom, especially, you know, we see these great men of God and there's so much of, not, not all of them, I'm not putting a umbrella and saying all of them are that way, but, I, I, you know, we see that it's so pompous and so, you know, uh, it looks more like a, like a show 
right? And sometimes it's important to remember that this whole ministry is is not it's not about us. And the focus sometimes turns towards us, but our our the ministry, humble heart, leads people to Jesus. Right? Uh, one of the one of the uh, greatest example is John the Baptist. Right? Wonderful example, powerfully used by God. He's got his disciples there. Right? He's raised up leaders. Everyone are saying, "Oh, John the Baptist, wonderful man, John the Baptist." Oh, he's you know going and baptizing people, and uh, uh, no one can go against him. He's got some uh, people around him. Now, when he sees Jesus, what does he say? Behold, the Son of Man who takes away the 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 sin of the world. And then, what does he tell his disciples? Right? Uh, his disciples ask him, "Hey, uh, uh, John, now what's happening? They're all, uh, you know, they're all saying uh, about this man Jesus. He's got more followers than you." What does John the Baptist say? Hey, it's not me. He is the Messiah. You go to him. Was uh, John the Baptist no, not worried about his fan following and his disciples? He was not. It didn't worry him a bit. He says, I'm not worthy to even untie his sandals. Right? John the Baptist was willing to just let go of everything. He says, don't follow me. I am pointing to him. Please go to him. Go to the Messiah. Right? And it showed that he was such a humble man. But was he walking in authority? Yes. Moses too, humble man, walked in authority. So as believers, we have to have that balance. Right? The moment we don't humble ourselves, we saw the example of King Saul. Right? He thought... You know, uh, the, uh, King Saul, he himself knew. You know, as Samuel reminds him and says, King Saul, there was a time when you thought very low about your own self. But God took you and from nowhere, you are nobody. You are nothing. You were just a little boy who's walking around here in the land of Kish. You, you, you don't deserve to be, on paper, you don't deserve to be the king of Israel. But God took you because you knew nothing and you were a humble man. Right? Uh, God tell, Samuel says that. He says, there was a time when you looked at yourself as a very small person. You were very humble before. So God took you and made you the king of Israel. Now, after becoming the king of Israel, you have disobeyed God. And, you know, you have gone against God. Now you think that you have done the greatest thing. And so God rejects him as king. So remember that even as we do ministry, our beginnings are small. It's humble. Even as we grow big, stay humble. The more we stay humble, we say, God, it's about you. Right? Uh, and I have, you know, there are plenty of situations where there are times when, you know, in ministry, you will have people against you, people talking and all of that. Many times I felt like, you know, just uh, telling them, you know what, this is what the word of God says. Why are you? But I realized that, well, you know, it's better to just keep quiet. It's okay to, you know, there are times we have to keep quiet. There are times we have to speak up. Many a times I, I've just kept quiet. And I said, okay, God, you leave, you do it. You have called me. It's your ministry. If I've done something wrong, forgive me. But if it's not something that I've done wrong, you look after this. You solve this whole problem. Many a times, because of being silent and because of just letting go, you know, they themselves have come and said, you know, Pastor, you know, I was upset. I shouldn't have said this. This is something wrong I did. Please forgive me and all of that. And if we just go back to forgive them, continue the ministry. What would have happened if, you know, I had said, no, actually, this is what happened. He did this. He did that. It would have just gotten worse. Right? So learn to walk in humility. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin 
and I will heal their land. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, the moment we humble ourselves is only when we will be able to repent of our sins. Right? If we don't humble ourselves, we will not be willing to repent for our sins, but we will justify the wrong that we did. Right? God calls us to humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. Right? And then when we seek him, he will answer our prayers. He promises to hear us. He promises to forgive our sins. He promises to heal our land. Right? So we will stop here. Uh, we'll pick up from the second point again from next week. Um, and right, yes, thank you for the comments here from Rupa. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Manohar, he must increase, I must decrease. Very true. Right. Uh, so we'll wrap up here. Any thoughts, any questions? Uh, anything you'd like to add? Uh, so I'm looking at our notes. We have another chapter after this. So we'll probably uh, need about four more classes and then we may be able to finish our portions. Just a gentle reminder that our the midterm semester uh, as uh, exams has been posted on the classwork tab, please go ahead and finish that, complete it, and post it back in the classwork tab so we can mark you for the same. Okay, uh, right, shall we close in prayer? Any thoughts? Anyone have any questions? If not, we can close in prayer. Yes, go ahead, Rupa. Uh, yes, Rupa, I think, uh, we can't hear you. I don't know if it's only me. Your voice is very low. Yeah. Right, I think uh, she's trying something. A anybody else has any thoughts? Um, any questions about your tests, exams? Okay. Okay, I think uh, we're running out of time too. Uh, so shall we just close and prayer? Maybe, uh, Sister Rupa, maybe we can take your question next week. Sorry about this because I think we don't have time. Uh, so let's just close in prayer. Uh, Yes, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Maybe Mr. Manohar, can you please lead us? Closing prayer, please. Holy Father, <coughs> Holy Father we thank you, Lord, for this morning. <coughs> thank you, Lord, for teaching us about the revival and uh, uh, what we have to prepare ourselves for the revival, Father. Lord, help us, Father. Oh, grant us this humble heart before you, Lord. Lord, we may desire your presence more and more and humble ourselves, Father, in all our, Lord, whatever we achieve in your kingdom, Father, we may give glory unto you, Lord, unto you and you alone. So that, as John Baptist said, you must increase and I must decrease. Lord, help us, Lord, that this may be our motto in the ministry, Lord. We may give all glory unto you. Oh, God, very humble ourselves. We know that you come in there with your mighty presence among us, Lord. You prepare us, Lord. Lord, you give us direction to our life. And you teach us and instruct us in the right way, whom to speak, how to do the ministry, and how to humble ourselves more and more. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful teaching we have received this day. Lord, this teaching we have received, Lord. It may remain in us throughout our whole life, Father. Lord, being steadfast, being uh, firm on this, uh, I, on this truth, Lord, of, of, you know, on this truth of humility, Lord, we may we may do the ministry in this world so that our ministry may be pleasing unto you. Lord, when you see what we do for you, Lord, it may please your heart. Oh God, our ministry may rise before you as a sweet swelling aroma unto you, Lord. Lord, help us, every one of us, to minister thus in our life and to glorify your name and your name alone, whatever we do in this world. And we may 
greatly be used for that for bringing many people into thy kingdom we thank you for hearing us bless the pastor lord lord use him mightily in the ministry i want him more and more father so that powerfully he may do the ministry in this world for which you have called him in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you mr manohar thank you everyone have a wonderful week ahead uh, we will meet next week god bless you god bless